So touring car racing, particularly in Britain, has got a bit of a reputation of being an elbows out sport where everybody's firing each other off left, right and centre. But the reality is it's, it's a lot cleaner than people think. You may have seen stories in the past of people like Jason Plato and Matt Neal kicking seven colours of snot out of each other on the track, but they were actually the clean drivers. And all of this was at its peak during the 1990s, when super touring was the rule set in use. These were modified family saloon cars tuned up to race at the tracks across the UK, and were insanely popular due to the fact that these were cars that could have been bought at any dealer showroom. At its peak in 1997 and 1998, there were 10 full-up manufacturer teams on the grid, with drivers earning big money and the teams spending big money. And in 1995, the smash and bash got so bad that the clerk of the course had to pull everybody together and tell them to knock it off. The 1995 season had some rule changes in response to the Alfa Romeo storm that had been raging the previous season. Basically, the rules were up to this point that if you wanted aero on your car, the road-going car had to have it, or you had to build some sort of homologation special. So if the road-going Mondeo had a wing, the race car could have a wing. But what Alpha did was they built a road-going 155 that had the rear wing and splitter tucked away in the boot and under the front bumper. Undo a couple of bolts, slide the splitter forward and tighten, and boom, touring car on your driveway. But there was a huge storm over whether this was aftermarket aero or not. So going into 1995, aftermarket aero was allowed to a point, and it's partly because of this the meme that is the Volvo 850 estate disappeared off the grid, because they couldn't make the aero work on it. So for the 1995 season, it was replaced with the regular saloon version. As well as this, Jan Lammers had been replaced with 1992 champion Tim Harvey, due to Lammers not quite being able to hack the elbows out style of racing in Britain. Nine manufacturers were on the grid this season. Defending champions Alpha, Renault, Ford, Vauxhall, Peugeot, Volvo, Toyota, BMW and Honda, with the Renault operation now being run out of Grove in Oxfordshire, as the Williams F1 team was running Renault in touring cars. Driving the two Renaults were Swiss driver Alain Menu and Will Hoy, a driver we unfortunately lost 20 years ago this week through a brain tumour. And the 1995 season was going to be way different than whatever came before. Not only was aftermarket aero now a legal thing that you could use, but it seemed that Alan Gow, the guy who runs the whole series, a bit like Bernie Eccleston used to, was doing the wrong kind of rain dance. In 1994, there wasn't a single wet race in the British Touring Car Championship. In 1995, it seemed that whenever they went to Brands Hatch, there was enough rain for the entire decade. It was soaking out there. The season had already visited the Kent circuit once already this year, but it was on the shorter, tighter and more frantic indie circuit for rounds 3 and 4. Tim Harvey had won both races in his 850, and the season had, up to this weekend at Brands, been Donington Grand Prix, Brands Indy, Thruxton, Silverstone National, Alton International, and now the two races at Brands, on the Grand Prix circuit that is, which would prove to be a very wet rounds 12 and 13. The previous Brands Hatch round had also been wet, which had seen Cleland get fired off by Rydell in race 1 and other incidents. Alpha had been a little off the pace this year, and the title fight was turning out to be between Renault, Vauxhall and Volvo, with Volvo's new Saloon 850 proving to be better than the estate that had come before. Every single race, with the exception of race 2 at Silverstone National, had been won either by a Renault, a Vauxhall or a Volvo, with Paul Radisic breaking up that combo in race 2 at Silverstone. For Vauxhall, it was series stalwart John Cleland partnered with a young Yorkshireman called James Thompson. Menu had put his car on pole despite not using the purpose-made qualifying tyres. They didn't want to work on the Renault as well as they did on the Ford, but it seemed to work. At the start of race 1, the field somehow managed to get through a sopping wet paddock hill and got down towards Druids. On the exit, Thompson pulled alongside Menu and accidentally got biffed off onto the grass. When he came back on, he was hit by Radisic's Ford, and then that caused a chain reaction. Thompson, Radisic, Ricard Rydell, David Brabham, Johnny Chicotto, Matt Neal and Simon Harrison all copped some damage, with Neal and Radisic eliminated where they were, and Thompson picked up a puncture. The race seemed okay after that, they all tried to find their feet on the sopping wet track, but Tim Sudgen had a little bit of a problem of his own. The windscreen on his Toyota Carina was starting to fog up and he couldn't see particularly well, and because he couldn't see particularly well, he had to slow down, so then he started losing positions. One to Julian Bailey, one to Derek Warwick, and then one to Ricard Rydell who was coming back through the field. But on lap 11 the race was red flagged because the car upside down on its roof was a Toyota. 
It had gone straight on at Surtees, entered the gravel trap, hit the tyre wall and rolled. It took them 20 minutes to extract the Toyota and the race would resume with the results taken on an aggregate time over two separate races. An 11 lap race followed by the remaining 5 lap sprint. A little bit like how Suzuka 1994 was, which is probably a race for another day. Menu won race one with Cleland and Harvey taking second and third. Hoy was in fourth with Patrick Watts and Julian Bailey rounding out the top six, with the rest of the top ten being Rydell, Warwick, Simone and Giacotto. For race two though, it didn't seem to get any better. While the front runners managed to get through the first part of the circuit okay and get onto the Grand Prix loop okay, the red flags were brought out again because Nigel Smith's Vauxhall had been biffed into the gravel accidentally by James Kay's Honda, and the stewards thought that it was in a dangerous position, so red flag. Fine, okay, 14 lap restart, let's go. But by the end of the next restart, the red flags had come out again because Rydell had developed a throttle problem. Basically, throttle got stuck and at Westfield, straight on into the wall and rolled it. This is where things start to resemble something from school. Don't know about where you live, but here you'd get called into an assembly first thing in the morning because someone shoved bog roll down the toilet and flushed it to flood the toilet or some prankster has rearranged the floral display on the roundabout to say, we come tit village. Basically, the clerk of the course and Mr. Pierre Amonier summoned all the drivers to a meeting. But he didn't meet them in his office or the briefing room or the pits. He proceeded to tell them all off on the starting grid in front of the fans. Amonier was absolutely livid with the drivers because this had been a season of red flags and not just a race weekend of red flags. At four of the previous five race meetings, there had been one race stoppage, and the series was starting to look silly. But while there had been red flags aplenty at this round at Brands Hatch, it wasn't because the driving standards had been terrible. You'd got the incident on lap one that involved several cars. That was just typical BTCC door banging in the wet in cars that take up a lot of real estate on that particular track, and they had really tiny wheels at that time. Nine inches or something like that. Then you got Sugden's windscreen fogging up, which, okay, maybe that needs looking into, but Rydell didn't exactly intend to have his throttle do what it did, and Smith was, again, biffed into the gravel trap on a wet track, and just left in a situation that the drivers thought was good enough for maybe just a safety car. You only have to look at Spa 1998 with David Coulthard dropping his car on that drain cover. It was just one of those bizarre things that happened. It's not like he intentionally threw his McLaren across the traffic and wiped out 13 cars on the way down to Eau Rouge. Amanier told the drivers that he was at the end of his tether and if there was one more red flag, the weekend would be cancelled. The drivers tried to turn it back onto Amanier by suggesting whether or not they should have been racing there in the first place because of how things were going. Cleland, Harvey, Warwick and others all thought Amanier had overreacted and Harvey was saying that the rain was getting worse and visibility was nearing zero in the spray and Amanier wasn't seeing anything from their point of view. The race restarted and was won by Cleland in a Vauxhall 1-2 ahead of teammate James Thompson. The rest of the top 10 was the two Renaults of Menu and Hoy, followed by Harvey's Volvo, Bailey's Toyota, Radisic in the Ford, Watts in the Peugeot, and then the two BMWs of Chicotto and Brabham. In an interview with 90sbtcc.com, Cleland said, That was some meeting. I went on to win the race after that very public schoolboy bollocking we all got in plain sight of the main grandstand. I accused the clerk of the course of being on drugs that day. He didn't realise how hard it was to stay on track the conditions were that bad. We were not all jumping off track deliberately. Now obviously that got me in the shit since it hit the press the following day. Oops. What a legend. Cleland would actually win the championship that year with 348 points to Menu's 305. Cleland won the next three races after this including the Silverstone support race for the British Grand Prix and would be off the podium just three times for the rest of the season winning with sheer consistency. I'd call him the Wizard of Wishaw, but that's John Higgins, isn't it? It was his second and final BTCC title, and 1995 was the year before Super Touring started to get mental. In 1996, Audi would join with their four-wheel drive A4 and dominate, and then in 1997, Super Touring would pretty much reach its peak before dying around the turn of the century. Costs escalated far too much and the manufacturers backed out all at once, basically leaving it as the Vauxhall show for a few years. These days, it's quite secure. Not as popular as it once was, but at least it still exists. And it's still very much worth watching. So then, a look at the time the headmaster told off all of the schoolboys for basically mucking around when they weren't mucking around 
in front of the paying public at Brands Hatch in 1995. If this has been something new for you here today, then do give the video a like, and for more stuff like this, get subscribed with the bell on for anything else that I do here on this channel. And also, while you're at it, go onto Twitter and give 90s BTCC a follow as well, because they always post interesting stuff like this, which gave me the idea for this video. Massive thanks to the fine folk at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help out with image purchasing for these videos, then you can help out by following the link in the description, where there's also a link to Discord and to my socials. Or there's super thanks down there if you just want to buy me a coffee or a pint. Speaking of which, I'm out of coffee. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.